Good morning, everybody. I'd like to give a big thanks to Milbury Polk and Richard Weiss for host, co-hosting such an amazing few days here. Thank you. <laughs> this quote that you're looking at was first shared with me by a powerful Inuit woman who's been fighting for 25 years for Indigenous rights. Her name is Sila Watt Cloutier. Perhaps you've heard of her. She wrote an amazing book called The Right to be Cold. And despite the reality of this quote, there are many reasons for me to have hope. Quantum social change doesn't require us to wait for some remarkable leader or hero to show up to introduce solutions that will save us. It's about each of us acting right now within our own dynamic context and spheres of influence to generate new patterns, ideas, and relationships. And that's why we're all here. And that is what's next. Collaboration, inclusivity, compassion, curiosity, and creativity to be more useful together as explorers. I love what Bertrand Picard shared in his opening video. Quote, Explorers are not satisfied with what they see. They want to do things differently. What can we explorers do together to bring more harmony and wisdom to the world? How can we be useful together? Well, what can explorers do to bring more wisdom and harmony to the world? It looks like this. And that's right, it was never a dress. It sounds like this. Natalie Schmidt, Dr. Cyan Proctor, Brandy DeCarly, Carol Beckwith, Angela Fisher, Beverly Joubert, Iriona Hisoli, Lila Haza, Asha DeVos, Eddie Witter, Rachel Graham, Caddy Coleman, Nicole Stott, Rita Marquez, Rosalie Lopez, Shauna Panya, Hilda Follenström, and Ankuri Majundar. That's what it looks like. There's another question to ask in this, what's next? What role do I personally have in this climate crisis and the sixth mass extinction that we're all bearing witness to today? We must live the questions and we must try within our immense power that we all possess to be part of the solution. I've had an amazing life, and after 25 years of physically moving around from pole to pole and places in between, I actually asked myself that same question just probably three and a half, four years ago. How can I be part of the solution? What can I do to be relevant? I mean, climate change, as we all know, is not a spectator sport. And so in 2016, I met my best friend turned expedition partner, Hilde Fallenström, She's somewhere out there. Will you wave your hand? There you are. So this, is, this woman is the true Annie Oakley of the North, who um, rather synchronistically burned with the same questions I had. So it was no mistake that we would meet. And in a very bold move, we actually took our love of adventure, exploration, and all of our knowledge around the changes that we've been experiencing in the polar regions. And because we are not scientists, we have had the pleasure of hanging around with, a very, with very many um, smart scientists like so many of you in the audience today. And for that, we have gained so much knowledge around changes and that everything is connected. So we actually uh, started a project and we pulled our collective network together and we um, started something called Hearts in the Ice, which is a global platform for dialogue, inspiration, and social engagement around climate change. It was um, a very uh, interesting project that took a lot of people, uh, a lot of people in our network to get off the ground because anything that you write on the back of an envelope, <laughs> you know, like they used to do in the old days, um, that involves lots of today, lots of spreadsheets and checklists. At the end of the day, it does always start with each of us making that first daring move. We are the communication bridge between science and the public. We built stories to communicate why, behind the science and data we were collecting, why does that matter to people who don't study science? 
every single thing we did uh, in terms of data collection was completely volunteer. We didn't get paid for any of it. We cut ties, both of us, to our full-time jobs, and we relocated to a tiny 20 square meters trapper's cabin that was uninsulated, never to be found on Airbnb, I can guarantee you. No running water, no electricity. We were closer to the lowest bound of the aurora than we were, which is at 100 kilometers above the atmosphere, than we were to the nearest town of Longyearbyen, 140 kilometers away. We spent 14,000, and for those of you in COVID at home that had to spend time together working, living, and on top of each other, you'll appreciate this. We spent 14,000 hours together. Um, we, and this over 19 months, proving that yes, in fact, it is possible to survive and thrive with the right team under extreme circumstances for an extended time. Our astronauts in the audience here today have proven that that's possible. We were actually subjects of NASA's studies on coping, problem solving, communication, isolation, and teamwork. And just a few touch points on what in the world we did up there in the north in this tiny little trapper's cabin. We collected 26 phytoplankton samples, 20 saltwater samples for Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Phytoplankton is responsible for over 50% of the oxygen we breathe, the lungs of the Earth. So yes, it matters to study that. We collected over 40 ice core samples for the University Center of um, Svalbard. We recorded over 35 cloud observations, over 100 aurora time lapse, and one rocket launch, all for NASA, um, which rendered the term to us uh, as extreme citizen scientists. So now we have that to, uh, to call ourselves. Polar bears, wind, and extreme cold were always uh, conditions that we were faced with every single day. And I know for a fact that many of you here know what it's like and the extents that we go uh, to keep batteries warm in the cold, right? We flew over 50 pre-programmed drone flights in 26 degrees Celsius, minus 26 degrees Celsius. The most powerful part of our project, though, was connecting with 100,000 youth from around the world via satellite telephone. And we had a diverse group of experts on every single call, many of them from the Explorers Club on topics that all related to Earth, ocean, space. We also collected dozens of um, kilos of plastic, which literally litter um, the west coast of Svalbard because of the circumpolar current. It's absolutely amazing to travel so far north, um, the northern's most, world's most northern settlement, settlement to the North Pole, to find it littered with marine debris. So we collected lots of that. Um, and we also, um, just this image here of a fulmar, in 2010 they conducted a study of dead fulmars. And one out of 10 at that time had microplastics in its stomach. And then fast forward, they did the same study in 2020, and they found nine out of 10 dead fulmars had microplastics in its stomach. They often mistake microplastics as a food source, which eventually renders the stomach incapable of digesting anything. And so they starve. What in the world are we doing? You know, I met Dr. Jane Goodall in Victoria, Canada, less than two weeks ago. This is what she shared. We are truly one interconnected species. And to think that we humans, who possess so much technology, are supposedly the greatest of intelligence, are actually destroying the very gifts that we've been given. How unintelligent is that? It was a sobering conversation with her. After our first nine months at Bumsabu, we were hoping to go home. <laughs> but as you all know, COVID came, and then a ship pickup was absolutely impossible for us. So as COVID put a pause on everything, the problem solvers that we are, we rode our snowmobiles eight hours over several glaciers back into the town of Longyearbyen resupplied and actually picked up the telephone first to connect with our partners to say, if we went back for another year, would be another 10 months, would that be helpful for you? And the answer was a resounding yes. So that's what we did. We packed up, resupplied, and went back to Bumsabu, our little Arctic resort, right? Uh, with the understanding that we actually were a lot more relevant and useful far up there in the, nor in the north, sharing stories of change and trying to inspire active engagement. We had over 100 polar bear encounters during our 19 months, and we lived in complete, and I mean complete darkness, were it not for the northern lights, for six months. Oh, 
two long polar nights, is what they call it up in the Arctic. This female polar bear is called N26131, and she's been tracked by the Norwegian Polar Institute since 2018. And we first saw her um, in April of 2020 with her little cub here, 15 kilos, four months old. And it was um, really interesting because the Norwegian Polar Institute could not fly. Their flights were hampered because of bad weather. So we got GPS coordinates and we rode out and we found her. And you know, you've heard stories of all of the wildlife on the planet and to, to, to lock eyes with a polar bear as we have done and to be in the presence of this Ursus maritimus and this most amazing um, marine mammal is to really take in a deep breath and, and just bear witness to the beauty that these, am these mammals are. And it's an absolutely, it's an experience that I hope you all have, actually. <laughs> um, we uh, found her in April, as I said, in 2020. And then in, on July 13th in 2020, she reappeared, 2021 actually, she reappeared just outside of Bumsabu, shaking her wet fur and rolling on the tundra, sadly without her cub. And July 13th, as I have learned, is, is Richard Weiss's birthday, and it's also Hilda's birthday, so next week. Um, in April 21, we were given, or in, yeah, April 2021, we were given coordinates for her whereabouts because they couldn't fly to find her and track her and find out if she was healthy, had she given birth to new cubs. So we again got the GPS coordinates and we rode out in a, like a needle in a haystack and we actually went to the top of a knoll, parked the snowmobile and looked down and there's tracks all over and you're just, <gasps> okay, back up a little bit. And then we rode down into this little spiny um, knoll and there she was with two cubs. She was fat and healthy, and so were the little cubs, despite the fact that the den that year was extremely cold. They could tell from the, from the uh, um, female's body temperature due to lack of insulation. So things are changing for them, and they are a resilient species, but, but things are changing. Storytelling through the eyes of citizen science is what we are doing with Hearts in the Ice. We have the power through citizen science to actually deepen our collective understanding so that the real extreme community scientists, the indigenous in communities around the world, can actually sit at the table to affect public policy and put funding and tools of the hands of the local communities who have been and are on the front lines of the impacts of climate change, protecting what they love. And in this slide right here, you can see the community science have evol has evolved um, over many decades now and is being more recognized as a form to actually be a bridge between the science that's out there and the people who don't read all the abstracts and the people who are out there wanting to understand what in the world is happening and how can things change. So we are on that level four now as extreme citizen scientists and our goal is to build out our program so that we actually can provide scientists and the explorers and others with resources and tools to go out there to collect more data. So now I'm going to take you from the Azores to the Arctic for a short little video clip to give you an idea of what we did and where we were. And then I'll come back and then I'm going to share a little bit about what in the world might I have learned after 19 months. To live here in the Arctic, to overwinter and experience time standing still, is to lose your thinking mind to regain your senses. It is to live as one with the cold, dark, simple existence. Welcome to Bamsebu. This is an old trapper's hut built back in 1930 for uh, uh, beluga hunting. <clears throat> and this has been our home now. We are both experienced seasoned polar explorers and guides. And we both have decades of experience living in and working in cold climates. We're out here on a lunch break and it, it shouldn't be shouldn't be the way. Both of us already knew a few key researchers studying the polar regions, so we just reached out to see if we could be of help. 
This is Base Cab Bumsabu, and this is our citizen science lab. We're collecting data for eight international research projects up here. The goal is to engage the public and use the data collected to increase overall knowledge on a given subject. This is an ice core uh, drill, and we bring this out with our Lynx snowmobile out on the ice, and we drill two of these holes in the ice. The centimeters that's closest to the ocean, that's most important for the scientists, because in there, small um, organisms and larvae are having their first stadium of life. Most of what we are collecting, you can barely see, like microscopic algae under the sea ice. Yet it is connected to a web of life that is part of such a delicate balance, like spokes in a wheel. And now they, the scientists, are understanding that there are a few spokes out of alignment and things are out of balance. Right now there's absolutely no ice at the end of November, and last year there was almost a full fjord of ice, and here comes the drone in for its little landing. We have been able to walk along uh, the open ocean, along the beaches, and pick up debris. This is a, uh, a bird, a dead bird. And we often find these nets with the reindeer antlers because they itch in their antlers and they get stuck in it, into it and they pull this around until they can't pull anymore or maybe it's frozen or it's stuck somewhere and they, they starve to death. Life here is challenging. The darkness, the isolation, coming back from a scooter ride to find a massive polar bear on your doorstep, a meter away from your dog, the ice conditions, being in a boat and the engine not functioning, what do you do? Waking up after a storm and discovering that the front door has several meters of snow drift in front of it and you absolutely cannot get out. We celebrate the small joys here every single day and we make sure to acknowledge each other's efforts. Kind words and a smile go a long way in this world of isolation. Oh, it just <laughs> fell like an old horse. <laughs> there is absolutely no sign of a global pandemic where we are. It's surreal to think that the world is spinning off its axis just thousands of kilometers away. And we feel so extremely privileged to be exactly where we are. We care deeply about our planet, our natural spaces, our people, our animals. So we're working to protect what we love. Our goal has always been to take people out of climate despair and into climate optimism, which is about hope and action. Life is good here at Bumsabu. Life is as good as we make it. Absolutely. Right? Climate change does not take a break, so neither are we. Fourteen thousand hours. I said that already, didn't I? <laughs> That's no small expedition, and it's um, no wonder that actually the University of Bergen, the University of Minnesota, and NASA were interested in studying us. Uh, and those results, along with many of the data that we collected, have been stalled due to COVID and lack of access to labs, etc. But that should be coming out in the fall, so we'll share that. But, you know, reimagining science policy. It's very interesting. We talk about citizen science, and it's just really, um, you know, everyday people like us, those of us who aren't scientists, out in the field, in remote locations, often in locations that might be inaccessible to other people, collecting data that can inform science and policy. And um, there's a sweet spot right here, and it's right here, that intersection between citizens, scientists, and policy decision makers. And it's a reality to say that what happens in one local community affects all of us everywhere sooner or later. So all the more reason to have everybody sitting at the decision-making table. What does it actually mean to be a human alive today? I read this from Wade Davis's publication or one of his books. And 
uh, he wrote that there are over 7,000 languages to answer that, and that those are people of the world with unique expressions of the human imagination and heart. Imagine that. Preserving and protecting those voices, the traditions, and the knowledge of our ancestors and indigenous around the world is absolutely vital to keep the diverse fabric of who we are as people alive. You know, if you're lucky, you're going to take a trip to the moon or sit in an ashram for a month in silence. Or, if you like, you'll ski to the North Pole in the dark. Or, if you'd like, you can spend 19 months up at Bumsabu. But for most of us, that's just not a reality, right? Life is busy and there's a, there's a lot of noise out there. So to save some time, because we're honestly running out of it, I'm going to share a few of my learnings. I know what it's like to say that someone has your back and that you trust somebody with your life. I know and truly understand that we're collectively all, all of us are on a global expedition and that we have to use something called expedition behavior, which was first coined by the Na Paul Petzl, the founder of the National Outdoor Leadership School. School excuse me. And he has some very specific characteristics around what expedition behavior is. And I won't share that now, but I want you all to look it up. I know that we all matter and that every single one of us can make a difference if we exercise our intellectual flexibility. I learned how powerful two people can be when heart, soul, soul and intentions are in absolute perfect alignment. I learned to love being pressed into our natural world with wild hurricanes, whiteouts and changing weather 24-7. It was both difficult and beautiful, but I was absolutely fully alive. Some days were spent in complete perfect stillness, which is an absolute luxury for unfettered thought. The wind, I learned, was beyond taming. It tames you. I learned that without TV, the internet, or Netflix vying for mind space, that I could actually feel my own strength and power again, and that original thought had an opportunity to come screaming forward. I learned to listen to the wisdom of the silence and the wind. I learned to protect what I love and stand up for what I believe in. I learned early on that with every no we got before we left as we worked to secure funding, that it was just another opportunity to find the yes. I learned how Hilda and I can fix just about anything under any circumstances simply by being resourceful and packing your patience. I learned how important it is not to wait for things to happen, but to make them happen. I learned how with daily effort, it was possible to live someone 24-7 in a 20 square meters trapper's cabin for over 14,000 hours and still like her, still care for her and respect her. I've learned how to cope in the darkness and be okay with my dark parts. I've learned how important a sense of humor is. I've learned how I can even like myself a whole lot even without a shower for eight months. I've learned how important candlelight is and to celebrate the small things. I've learned how solar, wind, and living off-grid is absolutely possible. I've learned how much I need the natural world, wildlife, friendship, and community. And I've learned how I really don't ever want my coffee without half and half, but if I must, I can. I still have so much to learn, and I'll never stop being curious about technology, places, and people. And if we haven't already shifted our mindset in the last three days, I want to acknowledge the obvious, that climate change is a real threat for all of us, and it's all hands on deck right now. When we see the Earth as a living being with living beings on it as we are, we all become caretakers of this being, and not consumers. So in closing, I want to share some words from one of my heroes, Buckminster Fuller. Never forget that you are one of a kind. Never forget that if there weren't any need for you in the first place, you wouldn't be here on Earth. And never forget that no matter how overwhelming life's challenges and problems are, that one person can make a difference. In fact, it's always because of that one person that all the changes that matter in the world come about. So let's all keep being that one person. Thank you. Thank you.